we are going to start the Q&A session. Um, just a disclaimer, none of us have read these questions ahead of time. So, you know, if we have to pause and think for a second, just give us a little grace here. So this might be my favorite one. When's the next conference? <laughs> Please let it be in September next year. <laughs> what table that come from. <laughs> Did that come from yours? <laughs> oh, that was good. I like that. Um, we'll let you know. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> oh, so funny. Okay. Um, this one has Nick's name on it, but I'm going to ask it for Dave, too, because I know his story, and it's it's pretty cool. So both of you, when did you know that you were chosen by God to help serve the church? Any specific event? Oh, I'm still waiting on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, Dave. Uh, so I would say that um, when Heather and I first got married, we were living across the street from our pastor. Uh, that's kind of when I really felt called. And then there was a lot of years in between that before I felt like I let go and give God the opportunity to take control in that part of my life. So for Heather's health, um, when I got married, uh, my father-in-law didn't require a whole lot from me other than the fact that I had to have health insurance for my wife till the de day she dies. Uh, so in my head, that was the one thing I always controlled was her health care. And choosing a job always helped do that. So for me, I would say that um, when it came down to um, that opportunity to, to know that God's calling in my life finally had gotten to the point where uh, I could release that control and give it to God, um, I still did not have the answer. And God still showed up in great ways and supplied all of our needs all up to the point of ministry. And then uh, right as we were supposed to take the, the job transition at UPS, uh, from UPS to here, uh, Heather's cancer came back. And I think it was the... It was two days after the church announced it. <laughs> yeah, two days after we had announced it here for everybody, uh, Heather's cancer had come back. I'd gotten the doctor call and... At that point was like god like it would be a whole lot easier to just stay where i'm at at ups and to not make any transition to ministry and that would just fix a lot of problems uh, but i also knew that there was no peace, peace with that like god sometimes will give you a peace that's beyond all understanding and that was that peace so i just didn't feel the peace that i should stay at ups i felt the peace that we should continue to to move into ministry and like I said, God showed up in, in great ways, and I would say that, uh, like, even with that call, like, God is still, it's not like God has just given me everything right at once, but God is still kind of perfecting that call a little bit when it comes to what he wants me to do and continue to do. Yeah, I think uh, i just add, too, like, I don't know how dissimilar it is from anyone else's kind of move into like their career, right? Um, I think there's, there's some elements of knowing what the Lord's will for your life is, but also uh, one of the things that we try to, try to really emphasize is uh, Dave and I don't serve Christ in a more committed capacity than anyone else, right? That the call upon a, a pastor is uh, in many ways the call upon a Christian with, with the added teaching and leadership capacity of it. Um, but it doesn't mean that, like, oh, you have to be more serious about your Christianity and the rest of you can just be part-timers in that. Like, that's not allowed. Uh, they just pay us to do it, right? And so uh, in that, I think, I think like, I would, I would add that, that uh, for me, like, in, in the middle of my college experience was uh, kind of a change in what my career path was going to be. And, and I think... Uh, the Lord put some things in the right places and, and allowed for that to happen. Uh, but also, like, I don't know, um, I know, I know there's people who, who feel like, okay, ministry vocationally is a lifetime call. Um, I don't think if, you know, two years from now, 
I'm working at the post office, God has, has really changed my level of commitment or my level of involvement with him, uh, just changed my role inside of that. And so uh, the role of an overseer certainly comes with some godly responsibilities and some uh, s- specific things that are meant to be the case. Uh, but also with it, like, I-, I think you recognize that every believer has the responsibility uh, to respond in their life in a way that is what, is, what does it mean to be fully sold out glorifying the Lord, right? Like, uh, if you really want to serve the Lord with your life, it doesn't mean that you're a pastor or a worship leader or a missionary or a Christian school teacher. Like, those aren't the only options, right? Like, uh, and so in that, I, I think the encouragement in it is, like, it matters, but also, like, your occupation Whatever it is, is an opportunity to glorify God, which should just be, I think, worth clarifying in that whole process for both of us. Thank you. Okay, this is an either or, or kind of and together question. So, if there was just one thing we took home from your talk, what would you say it is? Or, while preparing for your talk, how or what did God reveal that was new or an important reminder to you? Okay, I'll start in this. Thank you, um, Shannon, for having this conversation with me. Um, Just, I struggled a little bit with writing my message this year because although there's plenty of scripture where emotion is shown, I couldn't find one that was like central enough that I could kind of branch off of to tie it back constantly to that one scripture, which is typically how I write things. Um, So just felt God just leading me to Google things, which sounds a little bit crazy, but to just look at it. And I think the cool thing is God is the God of science, and there's so much science that points back to him and his creation. And um, so for me, it was just reassuring to, to just know that God can be in those things too, even if they're not necessarily scripture or in his word, that he can still point to himself through tears or through psychology studies. Like here's somebody that spent 10 years and looked at it and di- dove in, and it scripturally does make sense. So um, so I would just say I'm just in awe of God that he cares enough about those things that he puts it on other people to study, and we can just learn from that as well. So, yeah. When Heather asked me to speak, and she told me the theme was the lives that we believe, um, I didn't have a clue where I was going to start but I started with what I was doing at the time, and I was reading through the book of Genesis again. I love the book of Genesis. Um, And I also had read this book, um, Changed into His Image by Watchman Nee, and it all seemed to fit together. And so while I felt like it was kind of heavy to talk about patriarchs, Today, it seemed to me that we have to have a strong foundation in who we are, who Christ is, what he has called us out of in order for us to be changed and able to resist the lies that the devil uses against us. And so... um, as I made the decision, that's where I was going, and I spoke to Heather about it. She shook her beautiful head, okay, that sounds okay. And so I proceeded from there, and God put it together. I'm, I would have to say, God put it together, and I just pray that you took something from that that you can hold on to, that you are chosen, you are gifted with the precious Holy Spirit, and salvation, and you are being transformed even in what you're going through today. So that's what I hope you take, and that's how it all came to be. So thank you for being so attentive. Uh, my vote goes for that. You should just know that. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to know mine, right? Just You're chosen by God, right? Gifted by the Holy Spirit. So go to church. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and maybe I, I think just reiterate, like, uh, as, as the very end of my talk last night, uh, just we talked about 
the church, and I think, and I think this is part of like our consumeristic, me-centric culture, right? Like we always want to talk about like how that benefits us or why that's good for you, and like I believe it is on a soul level, but but ultimately. I think one of the reasons that is so vital that you ought to be a part of local church community uh, is not necessarily for your sake, but because the church is God's chosen instrument to reach the world, right? That, that you're meant to be a part of church community for the sake of the gospel going forth. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, since my talk was the freshest one, you know, there's one important thing, one necessary thing. And to the, never forget that because life gets busy and distractions happen. And so often we want to go to God and say, but God, do you know what's going on in my life? Like there's different circumstances, right? We have this and this and this and this. And we come up with this list of, of the different natured things that are on, going on in our life that aren't going on in other people's life or at least what we perceive other people are going through. And, you know, sometimes when, when that happens, we always have that excuse to God and say, hey, like, this is the excuse of why I haven't had any time with you. And God says, why haven't you had time with me, right? So the one important thing is to spend time with God. And so often um, that's hard but necessary. And I would actually say for me, it's been, so I've, I spent months preparing um, and being in Romans 8 specifically. And back in the spring, God had formed a different message. <laughs> and then COVID hit, and it felt like everything in this entire world changed in God. So then I didn't know what I was going to say. I was at a complete loss for months. And even leading up just a few weeks before the conference, I still was just wrestling with things. Um, and then all of a sudden, God began to piece things together for me. But you know what was interesting is that the message he gave me, I feel like I was talking more to myself than anybody. Just a couple of days before yesterday, or no, it was Thursday. Yeah, it was Thursday. Um, our, we got notice that the school was shutting down because of COVID. I had been working at the school the day before at Picture Day. So I was waiting for a phone call from the health department. So I was freaking out. <laughs> uh, that's probably an understatement. <laughs> Remember that talk about emotions? <laughs> yes, I was a basket case. Because <laughs> I didn't know what to do. And I had just had my lovely husband read through my talk just to make sure everything sounded you know, theologically sound. And I specifically told him, I do not want any critiques unless I am, like, way off base here. <laughs> and uh, he lovingly looked at me and said, you are not living by the Spirit right now. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're right. <laughs> here I am getting ready to talk about fear and not living in fear and living by the Spirit. And I'm doing just that, living in fear. <laughs> it was an incredibly humbling moment for me. But it was also a good reminder that even though we think we may have it figured out, there we are still going to face fear. We're still going to face hardship. And the beauty about God's grace is that he doesn't say, oh, you screwed up again. You're out. <laughs> it's no. It's let's keep going. He picks us up. Let's keep going. And he's right there um, for us to ask and help. And as soon as I got down on my knees and I asked, got delivered. There was a sense of peace, and I got no call from the health department, so we're good. <laughs> but it was a good reminder just to um, practice what I was preaching. <laughs> so. All right, next question. Oh, thank you. Woohoo! Bring them on up. <laughs> okay. The earth is 6,000 years old. Can it be older than that? Who says God only made new things? I'm going to leave that one to you, too. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll field this one. Um, I, and I'll tell you a story uh, as a way of kind of giving a politician's answer. Um, so you know ahead of time I'm going to cop out. Uh, but in that, uh, a few years ago, uh, I was sitting about where Heather was on a stool, maybe that same stool, 
uh, and we were not yet here, so it would have been the better part of just over five years ago, uh, trying to decide uh, both, both for our family and for the church toward us whether or not this was the right fit for us and, and where we were going to be in ministry. Uh, and we had this time of like question and answer, uh, tell us what you think, tell us what you believe about things. And, and I don't remember all of the questions. I do remember a few of them. Uh, I remember specifically uh, Cheryl Loken asking me if I believe in a literal seven-day creation account of Genesis. Uh, and, and I'll answer the same answer that was just over five years ago. And I think uh, it holds true today and, and probably emphasizes some importance today. Uh, I do um, because I think at the end of the day, when I stand before the Lord, there's not a lot of shame in saying, I just believed you at your word, literally. And, and if we're wrong on that and it's uh, to be understood more as a, a metaphor, fine. But here's, here's what's ultimately important in the creation account. And I would say in the first, first three chapters of Genesis especially, when Moses writes that, he doesn't have any interest in us trying to discover creation science and work out the details of how life came to be. He wants us to understand why we are the way we are, right? He's, he's helping us understand why we are created and helping us understand why we sin and rebel against God and help us understand why we ultimately need a Savior and putting in place the coming of Jesus. I mean, your Genesis 3, uh, verse 15, uh, God's going to, in the curse of mankind, talk about Eve and that her seed will crush the head of the serpent, right? So he's, he's evangelizing in Genesis 3, talking about the coming of Jesus. And so I think uh, we, put, we put a heavy amount of emphasis, and we kind of get really wrapped up in that. And I'm a science geek, and so I can, I can spend a bunch of time in there. But ultimately, that's a, that's a why portion of the Bible, far more than it is a what and how portion. And so we try to read in all of those answers. I think we find ourselves distracted at times from what ultimately is really important, which is that God did create the world and that God did create us and that God intended us to walk in life with him and that because of our sinful nature and our rebellion against him, that only comes through redemption in Jesus. And so I, I think the, the answer to that question is always bringing that back to the gospel. Now, from a scientific standpoint, like, I think you should take God at his word. And if we're wrong, I, I've been wrong about a lot of things. You can ask my wife later. Uh, but maybe like three at least. Um, but, but in that, right, like, I think, I think the key point of emphasis over and over again, we think about origins of the earth or we think about uh, how to reconcile uh, faith and science is that uh, – our faith speaks to the whys of mankind and the origins of mankind, uh, and science doesn't even come close to addressing or answering either of those questions. And so I think that's where you, you continue to go back to is what's the point of emphasis and what matters. Any other comments about that? Nope. Okay, go. <laughs> okay. Um, we're all married, so we can. any one of you can chime in on this. We talked about how to do marriage well. How do we do alone well when we've lost a spouse or have a spouse that is not well or incapacitated? Well, I've been married, it'll be 64 years in December to the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> And um, we are both declining. I know we are. We can't see it well, but I can see it in him and he can see it in me. <laughs> um, so we're, we're, we're learning to deal with the changes in our lives. And um, we are firmly grounded in that Christ put us together all those years ago and he will provide for us in the days ahead, no matter what they are. And more than likely, one of us will be left without the other one. But then Christ will be our uh, 
closer companion even than when we don't have one another. It's a blessing to have been in this relationship with this wonderful man all these years and to learn from him and um, to just uh, raise family. And so we've got a lot of wonderful memories. It hasn't all been peaches and cream. Um, I know that. You know that. We all know that. But um, by God's grace, we've weathered those storms in good days and bad. And I just trust the Lord that he will continue to see us through when it comes to the point, unless he takes us both or he comes back. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? We could all go together. Um, but if that doesn't happen, I do believe that he will see to t us and take care of us, provide for us in that time. So we're not worried about it. We're just living our lives the best we can. We're using these bodies up so that they're going to be done with when, we're, when he's done with using us. So that's the best advice I can give anybody. I think I'm just, I, I don't have anything in our lives right now that this seems like it's imminent, but um, just hearing from Dave and Heather talking today and Sharon, just being encouraged to encourage my husband to make the Lord his one thing um, and just to allow time for each of us to grow in that relationship because if we don't do it now, when one of us is gone, it's going to be that much harder. Um, so priorities, we've talked about those too. And I think the I am second video, right? Like if I put my family first, then God's not first. And so um, I've just been convicted by that this weekend is just to really reprioritize and, and to encourage my spouse to really have that time with God and, and to grow in that relationship. So. I think it speaks too of, um, Nick was talking about this the other day with God being a jealous God. I mean, God desires our affection, and uh, when we are in a marriage, that that's not any greater or of any higher value of being single, right? So being a Christ follower is first and foremost, and even when you're married, you should have the same dependency on Christ in a married life as you would in a single life, and I think it's always important to remember and remind ourselves that like God is a jealous God and desires us to know who he is and to have our portion be of him and not of anything else. Because uh, so often, even in a married life, when you put too much hope or really any hope at all in your spouse, like you're going to be disappointed at some point. Like all your hope does not go in your spouse because it's kind of like what I had said when uh, Heather and I first uh, before we got married, you know, my hope was that after I got married that all of life would be fixed, and that didn't happen, and it's not meant to because we're supposed to find our hope in Christ, not to find our hope in another person, and sometimes another person can be distracting from that relationship we have from God, and even in the Old Testament, you know, as you look at um, just the, the call that God had for his people, his, his call was that you wouldn't intermarry because they're going to draw your hearts away from him. So even in the Old Testament, you see him being a jealous God and desiring us to be solely focused on him and only him. And if you're looking for um, a companion, then that could be a big distraction for your life. But, and then for the younger ladies, um, like still same thing, like, always remember that there's one thing that you need to hold up of great importance, and that's your identity and your relationship with Christ, and to know that he died for you. So, I think when you're young and married, you don't often think of that stage in life because it just it doesn't seem like it's anywhere near. But we came face to face with that with just a handful of years ago. When my cancer came back, it was all of a sudden a very stark reality that God could call me home at that point. And I had never really, I always knew that was a possibility, but at this point in my life, it hit hard. And I had three grown kids at this point, and so there was a lot more at stake, basically. And I remember um, 
having a conversation, um, just sitting there on the bed, and both of us just, we just sobbed and held each other because we don't want to live without the other one. But just, I keep going back to that quote from Anna Spafford. If that was God's will, that he would give us strength, um, if it was his will to heal us, to heal me, he would. And if it wasn't, he would give us strength to endure whatever awaited. And, and he did. He gave us the strength just to keep going. But it was a good realization that, um, that God needs to be enough. He can't fulfill every need I have just like I can't fulfill every need he has. And so if God calls one of us home before the other, we know that our faith in Christ is enough. God will fulfill the gap in there. He will make himself enough because he is enough. He really is all we need. And sometimes I think that idea is somewhat abstract to us um, until we are faced with that scenario. But just know that God doesn't always, I think, I think as humans, we, we want to know what's coming next, right? We want to be prepared. I know I'm like that. I'm a planner. I want to know what's coming next. But God doesn't promise us that we're going to know what's coming next. But he does promise us that he will provide in that. And it's one step at a time. So we don't know what that looks like sometimes, but we know that he is a faithful God and that we can rest in that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I don't know if it will be brief or not. but <laughs> um, So last one, how does someone identify a good church? What an unanticipated question that was. <laughs> Heather made me come up with a question because she was worried about not having enough. <laughs> well, use this one. I'll, I'll answer that, right? <laughs> so uh, the address 15691, County Road K, Darlington, Wisconsin, <laughs> First Baptist Church. You should, uh, no. Um, I was, so I ran out of time last night, but I was going to, was going to mention this at the end. A uh, couple, if you, if you read a couple books that I would recommend out of that uh, maybe maybe you're not connected to a church community and you're trying to figure out uh, where a good church community would be uh, and how to assess whether or not a church is sound, uh, is biblical, is uh, good for you to be a part of. Uh, there's a really short book by a guy named Mark Deaver. Uh, it's called What is a Healthy Church? Uh, and so uh, it's less than 100 pages and it's small. I would recommend picking that up. Uh, maybe you're somebody who has kind of like felt some, uh, whether it's brokenness or a reservation about church as a whole. Maybe it's something in your past that has kind of caused that. Or maybe you just feel like, you know, I have like, I have relational accountability. I don't really need the formal nature of the church. Uh, there's a book by a guy named Kevin DeYoung uh, that is called Why We Love the Church. And uh, I would recommend that as well. That's a little bit longer read, uh, but it's, I think it's a light read. It's worthwhile. So those, those would be a couple of resources I would point you to. But ultimately, uh, I think it goes back to uh, just a recognition of what the whole weekend's been about, right? A, a healthy church, a good church, uh, is a community of believers united together that you are a part of, a member of one another that ultimately exists to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. And so uh, ultimately all things come back to is God being glorified? Uh, and the way that he's glorified is when the good news of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection is put on the forefront. Well, that concludes our Q&A. I am going to pray for us as we move into our closing session. Father God, I just thank you so much for your word, I thank you that it is absolute truth and that when we are, we come face to face with questions or doubts, we can go back to your word and know that it is true. And that's where we can get our answers from, Father. God, I just thank you so much for this whole weekend. I thank you for the, the, the volunteers that participated in this, the speakers and the efforts that they put in. God, and I just pray that through all our words that were, were said, that you were glorified. God, we love you, and we thank you for your incredible grace and love for us. In your name, amen.